Welcome back, everyone. Uh, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome our BJ Ferguson lecturer, Dr. Richard Harvey from Sydney, Australia. And uh, it is early morning time in uh, Sydney. So Richard, I really appreciate you getting up and, and being with us for this time. This is a, a lecture that was started about four years ago in honor and memory of B.J. Ferguson. And I know you know B.J. well. B.J. was a inspiration to many of us. Uh, she was such an amazing woman. The way she uh, was curious about everything in life. And she cared about astronomy, poetry, food, drink, art, science, medicine, allergy, and rhinology. And she went about all of her explorations in a very humble way and uh, was not a afraid whatsoever to voice her opinion, but was also immensely humble and nicest to the small of us. Uh, and she was that way with me when I was just a a uh, young physician straight out of training. And many of us probably have stories about what a wonderful woman uh, she was. And so it is in her memory that we are presenting now a featured lecture for this afternoon with the, one of the preeminent rhinologists in the world. Uh, Dr. Harvey maintains a busy clinical rhinology practice. And yet through his career, he has uh, contributed really amazing amounts of new information that touch on every aspect of rhinology care, whether it's pathophysiology of stopped. disease, diagnosis of disease, the, the ideal in medical progress. And surgical treatments for various forms of rhinosinusitis, CSF leaks, skull-based tumors, literally everything. And, and he has published over 800 papers which is just mind boggling to me. And, and pre COVID he traveled the world and we were fortunate to be able to, to see Dr. Harvey in person. Uh, but now we are very grateful we can at least uh, bring him to you uh, in this virtual format. And so Dr. Harvey is going to make some remarks and then we'll have about 30 minutes afterwards uh, for some uh, questions. Uh, touching on the, the topics that Dr. Harvey discusses. So without further ado, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Harvey. Thanks very much, Matt. That's a very kind introduction. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely honored and excited to, to give this talk. Um, I, I hope you can see the slides now and everything's good to go. Yes. Yeah, look, and, and, and I knew BJ Ferguson from my early career in the academic world, you know, she certainly was a great thinker. She was engaging at conferences and uh, certainly a, a contributor in our profession that's sorely missed. And, and I think I'm going to touch on, you know, one aspect of her work that very much relates to what I'm going to talk to about today. Now, there's my disclosures. I don't think anything here really affects my opinions of what I discuss. Uh, first thing I want to talk about is how do we discuss the classification of CRS? Well, you know, for, for me, we, we acknowledge for a long time that there's a whole range of pathophysiologic processes that go on to produce chronic mucosal inflammation of the upper airway. But we've really failed, I think, as a profession to move away from the concept of just calling it all CRS. Asthma doctors, respiratory physicians, are very bright colleagues, and they've been on to this for years. They've acknowledged that in the lower airway, that they can't simply use the term asthma, which just implies inflammation and bronchospasm, that they've had to separate out really what happens in the lung that creates it. And, and they now use, I guess, asthma as an umbrella term. And to me, that's very much like we use the term chronic rhinosinusitis. It's simply just an umbrella for saying that it's chronic inflammation. It doesn't imply anything, in my opinion, with regards to treatment or classification. 
And likewise, I think the term nasal polyps is about as ambiguous as an umbrella term like asthma. What about even the causes of CRS? I think when I look at slides of when people contribute, you know, what, what are the mechanisms that produce CRS? Residents these days are faced with this sort of slide, which really gives no direction at all as to what's really important and what really needs to be considered when it comes to what are the driving factors in the CRS and what's required for treatment. And really, when you look at that sort of slide, you say, how does that translate into a treatment or management strategy? And the reality is it doesn't. And that's why we have such heterogeneous practice, I think, in our profession. It leads to scientifically unsound constraints to CRS management. I know healthcare insurers, you know, not just in North America, but elsewhere, they're crazy things like they will only provide pre-approval for surgery if you've trialed a nasal corticosteroid spray. Well, we know that, first of all, that nasal sprays don't reach the sinus cavity. They're really just a nasal cavity treatment. Most of them are indicated for allergic rhinitis and not sinus disease. And for someone like who has allergic fungal rhinosinusitis, they're really not appropriate at all. They should be going straight to surgery. Many providers and payers insist on antibiotic therapy when we know that most polypoid conditions have little infective basis. And even as far as I've seen, where some resource um, providers and insurers will only approve surgery in those radiologically diseased sinuses on the day of the scan. And, and we know that as an inflammatory process, it has flares and exacerbations. We've been shown that the radiologic opacification can differ in, in severity and pattern temporarily, but depends on when CT scans are done in the same patient. Now, We've acknowledged for a while that we can't diagnose or treat CRS as some homogenous group. And you know who started that was actually BJ. So BJ's trilogic thesis here that she submitted um, on eosinophilic mucin rhinosinusitis, this whole paper was a, about separating out the phenotype of allergic fungal rhinosinusitis from eosinophilic mucin rhinosinusitis, essentially as we know it now, just eosinophilic CRS. And, and she understood very early on that you have to separate that out, not just in clinical trials and for clinical research, but you've got to separate it out in treatment guidelines because they were managed very differently. And that's 20 years ago. But listen, 20 years on, we're still discussing sinus disease like this. This is a, a slide where there's been a very good attempt at trying to place where polyps, non-polyps, our different phenotypes all sit. And, you know, you have to include here in this slide the concept of someone who has just a unilateral OMC pattern CRS. Now, once you add in that phenotype, look what we have. On one slide, we've got someone who's got cystic fibrosis, someone who is an allergic fungal rhinosinusitis sufferer, and someone who has a unilateral OMC CRS condition. Now, I can say from my experience as a rhinologist, I'm sure many people here, those three patients are so incredibly different as a person sitting in front of me in the clinic and they're incredibly different about how we might treat them. And they really have nothing to do with each other in my opinion, yet we're still sort of all bundling them together like this. So I wanna to talk to you then about how we need to move away from this concept of polyps or no polyps. Now, I have to give Witzke Fockens here great credit. She, she and Valerie Lund spearheaded the EPOS 2020 group. And really as part of that guideline, they really made a huge effort to move away from the idea of polyps, non-polyps. And we've got a range of treatments coming through the pipeline now, especially in the world of biologics. And we need to integrate the way that we think about disease so that it makes sense on how some of these new therapies are placed, making sure that they're used where they need to be used and avoided in other situations and where the surgery needs to be applied. So let's talk about the EPOS 2020 classification before we move on. Now, the first thing here is the concept of primary CRS. These are essentially people who just have 
sinus disease, they, they don't have or airway disease, they don't have other non-respiratory conditions or, or secondary pathologies. And I'll talk about that in secondary CRS. We've got enough time, I'll go through the secondary CRS classification. So the, the second level of, of classification is where is it anatomically distributed? We understand that the sinus cavities have functional units, you know, the frontal anterethmoid, maxillary sinus, they all drain through an OMC. Posterethmoid drains through the sphenoethmoid, the, the supermeatus and the sphenoid drains through the sphenoethmoidal recess. So there are functional units and we do see disease that's limited to those functional units only. And often it's just on one side when that happens. Um, there are people who have diffuse disease and, and it may not be, that's not pan sinusitis, but it just means it doesn't limit itself anatomically. And then at the moment, this is the third level, we really know a lot about type 2 or TH2 or eosinophilic disease. And that's where many of the novel therapies are coming out. There obviously are non-type 2 um, inflammatory processes. And, and at the moment, this system has left it purely as a, as a group, as a, as a one umbrella, as non-type 2. And this may expand over the years. But at the moment, this is where our both research and clinical innovation sits, type 2 and non-type 2. So let's look at some of those examples. Allergic fungal rhinosinusitis is a great example of a localized type 2 response. People get trapping of fungal containing mucin in one sinus cavity. They generate a hypersensitivity reaction to it. Now, whether or not it's purely IgE related or not, it's, it, it's still a localized issue. The good clearance of mucus from the other side is why it's unilateral. Non-type 2 your localized disease is someone who has just the classic osteal occlusion limited or isolated sinusitis. These patients do very well from any sort of surgical intervention. They don't have a broader immune interaction. It's very localized anatomically. Let's look at the diffuse group. Now, these are the patients who have a different condition. The type two groups, are the sort of classic central compartment atopic sinus disease, which is like an exuberant allergy. And I'm, I'm gonna discuss this here in a moment a bit more. ECRS, you know, these are patients who develop a severe type 2 eosinophilic inflammatory reaction, usually as an adult between the ages of 30s and 50s and associated with adult asthma. And because AFRS does recruit sinuses as it, as it gets expands and remodel sinuses, it's included here in this category as well. There is a, a growing evidence about non-type 2. We see it in the lower airway and it's perhaps less well-defined in the upper airway. But there's a group of patients who have a diffuse process going on. And I saw that um, uh, it was, I think Matt Ryan showed a nice uh, video of someone with a non-type 2 condition in one of his panels. You know, they often have polypoid-like mucosa. They often lack the sort of eosinophilic mucin. It's a bit more sort of purulent looking secretions. And they really don't have significant eosinophilia, nor do they respond to corticosteroids. And this requires a different approach again. I will touch on secondary CRS because we have the time here. Because people often ask me, what do you mean by CRS? Well, once again, it's broken up into anatomical distribution. But then it's just the mechanism. People have a localized problem. There's usually some other pathology going on. And great examples here are people who have a dental infection. So if someone has a dental infection here, such as a periapical abscess, they don't really have CRS. They've got a periapical abscess and their sinuses are secondarily involved. Likewise, fungal ball. Now, you can debate why it forms, but in essence, it's a foreign body. And fungal ball is an example here of a sinus cavity that's undergone a change secondary to the fungal material. And tumor is another example. Here's someone who's got an inverted papilloma. Now, they've got a range of sinus dysfunction around this inverted papilloma, but we don't really refer to this patient as having CRS. They've got a papilloma and the sinus dysfunction is just secondary to that. There is diffuse conditions that are all secondary and they're really broken into mechanical ones. And I think we're all familiar with the concept of someone who has primary ciliary dyskinesia. They're usually young with other issues. This is sort of a typical picture of what they might look like. Um, cystic fibrosis is another example. We're very familiar with what the scans look like in a patient with cystic fibrosis. And it's very important that, that patients with cystic fibrosis they don't have CRS, they, they've got cystic fibrosis in which one of the, I guess, end products of having that condition is that they get upper airway inflammation as long as, as well as lower airway inflammation. There are autoimmune conditions such as granulomatomas, polyangitis or vagueness, 
These patients don't just have airway problems, they have problems elsewhere, including their kidneys. And the same is true for um, so-called so Shirk strauss or referred to as now as eosinophilic granulomatosis polyangitis. And an immune deficiency. Patients who have immune deficiency, such as this person here with CVID, often gets rotating and migrating infections that come and go and they clear in between. And really, there's nothing really wrong necessarily with their underlying airway, just that they have, unfortunately, a broader immune deficiency. So I hope that gives you a really good feel, and we'll go back to primary CRS, about how I think some efforts are being made to change how we think about it. And it isn't too complicated. It's not trying to invent anything new. It's really just saying, is it a primary problem in the airway? Where is it anatomically distributed? And what's the endotype dominance? And you can pretty much fit every phenotype that's ever been described into that system. Now I'm gonna to touch on this now. This pathway, we start to talk about treatment. This is easy because these patients need surgery. If you have an anatomically localized problem, there's a very good chance that there's an anatomically local issue as to what, what needs to happen to break the cycle. And so if you alter the anatomy in these patients, it's often a very critical step in getting them right. And so surgery is the pathway there. I'm gonna talk now about this pathway, the diffuse group because I think this is less clear in many people's minds and is still an area of evolving understanding. So let's discuss the concept of diffuse CRS or the inflammatory CRS patient about how we really think about medical treatment. And this is the typical example here. And I think far more common than localized disease. But currently for diffuse CRS, I touched on this, you know, we discuss the treatment almost as different modalities, medical, and I, I crossed off or really then surgical for failures, you know, and I think that leads to a real misunderstanding of what's, what perhaps needs to be achieved in these patients. It's certainly, there's no real pathophysiologic goal with that. And that's why in, we get these crazy stories about requesting antibiotics prior to polypoid conditions, needing surgery, approving surgery only in those sinuses that are involved on the day of the scan. I mean, that's like, telling an asthmatic patient you're approved for an inhaler only in your right lung because on the time of your examination, wheezes were only heard on the right-hand side. We showed many years ago that the concept of maximal medical therapy is slightly flawed. You know, a lot of people were still symptomatic after maximal medical therapy. And, and even in a large proportions who said they were asymptomatic, they actually still had significant mucosal inflammation on CT scan. And although we all acknowledge that it's great to have a patient who's, who's asymptomatic, not surprisingly, many of those patients or most became symptomatic in the sort of, you know, six months after the maximum medical therapy was completed. Now, we've tried very hard to understand the different endotypes. And, and I have to give a shout out to our European colleagues here and the Galen group. Um, they try to sort of describe the phenotypes or endotypes of CRS. And really, although many of these markers are not available in clinical practice, they, they do boil down to an IL-5 negative and IL-5 positive subgroups. And really that breaks down to the type two and non-type two, the eosinophilic and non-eosinophilic groups. And that's why the current classification system is broken up that way. So when you look at this system, we really do break it into type two and non-type two because of that's where the research is and certainly where the emerging therapies are. Let's talk about the type two. So diffuse type two dominant CRS is important because it's eosinophilically skewed. They're not a patient population related to ventilation or drainage problems. And when it's diffuse disease, not really an infective disease process as we know it, they often have broader involvement of the rest of their airway, and they usually respond to corticosteroids. Now, once again, our respiratory doctors are very clever. They've been onto this for a long time and trying to sort out their world. And I love Sally Wenzel's diagram here, and I often use it in my talks because I think it's about where we are. We're a few years behind the, the respiratory doctors. 
And you can actually think about this. This is severity on the vertical axis and age of onset on the, on the horizontal axis. And I think you can overlay a lot of our current understanding of sinus disease here. And so I'm going to talk about this TH2 or type 2 or eosinophilic group first. And the first one that we see in this group is, is those who are, have an allergy. I mean, they often say to you, I've had sinus my whole life and uh, they often have childhood asthma. And this is essentially an allergic condition and, and it highlights, and this is one of the most important features in how this condition highlights itself, is that these patients develop edema off their middle turbinate. They get this diffuse, sometimes polypoid edema coming off the turbinate, sometimes referred to as middle turbinate polyposis. And this is a, a very strong marker of inhalant allergy. Actually, in, in the study by Anisa Hamazan, who's a PhD with us, it's a 90 plus percent positive predictive value of having inhalant allergy. So if you see this, it's almost irrelevant what the skin test says, these patients have inhalant allergy. Now, if you can appreciate that, then you'll appreciate Don, uh, John Delgadio's central compartment atopic sinus disease. This is where you get that inhalant allergy degeneration of the tissues in the central part of the nose, and you get this thickening around the septum and turbinate related to inhalant allergy. Now, it gives you this sort of peripherally or supralaterally spared sinus cavity. And when I gave a talk many years ago about this, and this is, you know, if you look on the endoscopy here, this you see this jelly-like edema. Valerie Lund came up to me after and said, oh, that's the black halo sign. And what Valerie is referring to here is that you have this central thickening where it almost looks like the surrounding sinuses are spared. And this is, this is very much this concept of central thickening from inhalant allergy. And she said she'd published on this and I couldn't find a publication, but sure enough, not in an actual peer reviewed manuscript, but in a book, she discusses the concept of the black halo sign. She acknowledged that there were these very inhalant allergy driven patients and look, even on the front cover of her book, she gives a great example of central compartment atopic sinus disease. Now, what's important is that these patients really get a secondary sinus dysfunction. Here's this patient, severe edema. Look, I'm pulling it out of the sinus ostea there. So they certainly get some secondary sinus dysfunction like barrow trauma, but it's not really a disease of the sinuses per se. So if you operate on them and you don't treat the underlying allergy, this is what happens years later. They just get all their polypoid edema back on their turbinates, but they've got normal sinuses. Because what, what hasn't been addressed here is actually the inhalant allergy. And that's what really needs to be managed in these patients. You cannot, in my opinion, nasonex this one away. These patients get such severe remodeling of their airway from their inhalant allergy. You really need disease modifying agents such as immunotherapy. And in Australia, we certainly have lots of oral immunotherapy agents available. And so if I was to say this group here of allergic CCAD type two diffuse CRS, these are the patients in which I think you probably can rely on nasal sprays to some degree with mild disease. Many people here need allergen immunotherapy introduced early on. Surgery is used to alter the remodeling, therapy, remodeling changes that occur. And probably biologics like omeluzumab that are an anti-IG agent are probably suitable for this group. Let's talk about the next group. So the next group, the concept of this is your true polyposis, your adult onset nasal polyp. Someone who says to you, I was completely well and then all of a sudden I got a cold and in their 30s to 50s, they've developed terrible sinus and asthma. And, and they'll often say, look, I either never had allergy before, um, but because allergy is so common in the community, they'll say maybe I had allergy and it went away only to come back later in life. Well, I don't think it really came back. I think, I think they, they had allergy and disappeared in like 20 or 30% of the population and now they've just unfortunately developed an eosinophilic airway condition, and it's not an inhalant allergy driven condition. And we think that it's a threat response from the epithelium that drives local innate um, lymphocytes to produce this uh, type of response. And that's still an area of ongoing research, but they look very, very different. You know, I note that this patient here is highly symptomatic. And when you look up at the middle meatus, just as Tom Higgins said in one of his panels, they often have one degree one or stage one polyps, 
but very strong inflammatory response, highly symptomatic. This patient's in and out of hospital with terrible asthma and they, and they have a very different look to their sinus cavity. And these patients have an inflammatory process going on, not in here, in this part of the nose, but it's over here, it's in the sinus cavity. And one of the biggest issues we have in these patients is we cannot get therapy into that cavity effectively. Now we can do it with systemic treatments such as prednisone, but of course, when we do that, we deliver just as much to every other part of the body, but to enable local therapy to work in this group, you really have to do two things. You've got to create a sinus cavity with a style of surgery that really opens up the sinus cavity. And then you've got to deliver that therapy with some sort of corticosteroid irrigation. We do now have obviously biologics and we'll probably discuss this at some point, but this is really very critical. You have to really open the sinus cavity up in a way that allows topical therapies to get in. We published a randomized controlled trial showing that if you take patients and you radically open up their sinuses with complete surgery, and then you give them a corticosteroid irrigation, they do much, much better than simply just surgery and a simple nasal spray. And that was the heart of that, that study. So in order to get these patients right, you've got to do a style of surgery that really brings about a treatment endpoint. And in Australia, you know, we've really abandoned simple nasal sprays for managing patients like this. And we make up corticosteroid solutions from a range of products off label. I know in the States, there's many uh, sort of extemporaneous compounding that's available here. And that certainly helps. Why is that important though? Why manage this eosinophilia with all these corticosteroid irrigations? You, you have to, because it is the degree of eosinophilic reaction in the lining of you, this person's airway, which dictates the recurrence of symptoms. This is a slide from our Japanese colleagues. They did a large study looking at recurrence relating to the degree of eosinophilia and really the recurrence of symptoms in these patients after surgery is directly related to the severity of their eosinophilia. So unless you, we manage that eosinophilia with some sort of ongoing maintenance therapy, these patients will fail over time. Now, we live in the golden age now of being a sinus surgeon. The for years, we've had very limited options for patients who can't fully be controlled with topical therapies alone. No matter how well you do your surgery and deliver your corticosteroid treatments, there are always going to be patients who fail. Just like in asthma, not every asthmatic is going to be managed with well-controlled or well-delivered inhaled therapies. Same is true for the sinus disease. So we now understand that we've got cytokine drivers down here in, in, in type two primed T cells. We have innate lymphoid cells that also release cytokines. There are epithelial release cytokines such as TSLP. And we also have IgE as a, as a, a, as a, a potential driving mechanism as well. And we now have ligand and receptor blockers for IL-5, dupilumab for IL-4 and 13, if omeluzumab to block out the IgE and, and even anti-TSLP agents that are in the pipeline. So really a great age of managing sinus disease where we now have multiple agents to help. So when we look at the ECRS subgroup, this is a group that absolutely needs a corticosteroid irrigation. They're the patients who used to take low dose oral corticosteroids, but pretty much now, we're going to step right into the world of biologics for these patients if they fail medical therapy. What about non-type 2? So we go back to our classification. We acknowledge that not everyone's type 2. Now, Justin Turner and some of his group have described some of these patients. They're often older. I think they lack corticosteroid responsiveness, um, you know, maybe smokers. And uh, certainly Sally Wenzel and uh, respiratory doctors acknowledge that this group very much exists in asthma. And we see it in the sinuses. This is a woman with a non-type 2 condition. Now, I didn't realize that at the time, 
And so I applied sinus surgery and a corticosteroid irrigation at three months. This is what I got. I made no difference whatsoever. Now, in the past, we didn't really understand how you picked this patient out. We said maybe older female, maybe non-corticosteroid responsive, but you only have to look at the tissue and the tissue changes are usually confirmatory. This is one of our sort of synoptic reports that we get uh, when we do biopsies at the time of surgery. And even though the pathologist has called it allergic polyps, there's no eosinophils there. And sure enough, when we place this lady on a macrolide, her airway inflammation, not just in her upper airway, but also her lower airway disappeared. Macrolides have a very important role in managing some airway inflammation. I mean, they have changed the disease course for conditions such as diffuse panbronchiolitis, but, but we've never really understood who it is that responds in the upper airway. Well, Gretchen Oakley, who worked with us, published a couple of papers around this field and showed that macrolide responders are those patients who are non-type 2. They have a low serum eosinophilia, low tissue eosinophilia, and so they really don't have a type 2 response. They're non-type 2, and they usually have, they lack extensive remodeling such as squamous metaplasia, which maybe implies a degree of irreversibility to mucus function. So when it comes to the non-type 2 or non-ECRS patients, this is when I use macrolide therapies. And I really abandon corticosteroid treatments. So what's important for classification and treatment? We talked about the, the localized group, but the diffuse group, if you said to me, how do we then take what we've learned and apply it into therapy? There's three things you have to consider. You've got to get the endotype right. You have to consider what's trying to be achieved during surgery. I think this is often forgotten. It's not a ventilatory or plumbing problem. So you can't apply those sort of surgical techniques. We'll talk about what I think is important to achieve in surgery. And you've got to identify at-risk patients because you don't want to get caught in a trap of just simply doing surgery and then giving topical care on everyone. There will be patients who are going to fail that approach. And it's nice to identify those people up front. So defining the endotype is critically important. And many people have heard me talk of, I spirit the advantages of asking your pathologist to give you some basic information. And this is a widely available um, synoptic report that we get from mucosa for inflammation. And perhaps one of the critical steps in this report is we ask the pathologist just to give us a feel about the degree of eosinophilia. And it's actually broken now into just three groups, less than 10 per high powered field, 10 to 100 and greater than 100. And it really is incredibly useful to separate patients out. So we get a feel for tissue eosinophil density. We get a feel for eosinophil aggregates. And I heard Klaus earlier today talk about charcolating crystals, the evidence of eosinophil activation. They get a quick picture of that for our patients. Very simple. It's just done under H&E stain, very quick. And this synoptic report was developed by a pathologist for pathologists. Why do we need to do that? Well, we know, this is a nice study by Deron Summer, that, that ECRS patients and non-ECRS patients, they do differ based on other features. You know, they lose their smell early. They, they have blood eosinophilia. We'll talk about that. They frequent adult asthma, high rate of recurrence. Really, they love systemic corticosteroids and they have a histology of, of, um, of tissue eosinophilia and remodeling very early on in their course. But Although you might want to use those other sort of, I guess, features of the phenotype, it, it really is eosinophilia in the tissues, which is very easy to diagnose. And as surgeons, we have such great access to tissues that we shouldn't really ignore this. You can use a serum eosinophilia as a biomarker. This is what asthma doctors and respiratory doctors have to use. And it's surprisingly, the, the level at which it predicts it, tissue eosinophilia is quite low. 0.24 cells ten by ten, 10 to the ninth cells per liter is actually still within the normal range. And at that level, you get a very good positive predictive value. But if you're below that, your negative predictive value is poor. So if it's high, it's good. But if it's not high, you still, you still can have significant tissue eosinophilia. But serum IgE does not predict tissue eosinophilia in our opinion.
So I don't use serum IgE in helping to defend the, the, the phenotype. Now, I'm going to touch in the last 10 minutes here a little bit about, you know, surgery. Correcting or reversing mucosal remodeling is a critical mechanism of why we apply surgery in these patients. Here's my patient several cycles in to biologic therapy and feeling so much better, especially their lower airways gotten better, but less so in their upper airway. But you know what? I don't expect anything more from my biologic treatment at this point. This patient has had sinus surgery many years ago and has had mucosal remodeling occurring over many years of poorly controlled inflammation. They've had fibrin cross-linking, deposition, extensive changes. And just like the patient here on the left-hand side, once you develop this sort of polypoid degeneration in the nose, turning off the inflammatory drive with a biologic agent or even oral corticosteroids doesn't make them disappear. And having large polyps like that in your sinus cavity creates problems. It creates mucus trapping, secondary infection. And so the critical role for surgery is to reverse and remove the remodeling that's occurred and give people a simple functional sinus cavity that doesn't undergo obstruction, blockage, or mucus trapping. It's no surprise then when you look at polyp changes on biologic studies, that if you look at some of the changes from baseline, omeluzumab fairly reaches 20% change, dupilumab's the best at 30% change, MEPO at 20%. And there's a very nice meta-analysis, I thought, done by um, a group where they looked at nasal polyp score across all the biologic studies to show that on average, just over one point of change on a biologic on, on biologic therapy. Now, I think that using polyp score as a measure of effectiveness of biologic therapy is completely flawed. There's no expectation from what I understand of why polyps form that biologics would suddenly make them disappear. But, but unfortunately, it was used as a, one of the primary outcome measures and you can see here that actually the treatment response is very modest. What about surgery to avoid mucus plugging? To me, this occurs in the lower airway. We see patients who have terrible asthma and they get mucus plugs in their bronchi. And we see it in these patients have upper airway disease. Here's a patient of mine who's had very successful control of the disease for a number of months to years. And then they've had a flare and they've been left with a mucus plug in their maxillary sinus. And so this also occurs in the sinuses. So when we do surgery, we need to consider reshaping and remodeling the sinus cavity to prevent that from happening. Because this is the other thing that occurs in surgery, and that's mucus stasis. This is where mucociliary clearance fails to return. And here's a patient who's been sent to me He's had polyps. He's had very nice surgery by a colleague, being put on a corticosteroid irrigation, got a great result, but getting persistent cacosmia and bad smell. And you can see he's got some mucus trapping in the maxillary sinus, and you can see it here in endoscopy. Now, you might say there's reasons why. He's got a very deep, low maxillary sinus, a small opening. Maybe, maybe you know, the irrigations don't get in there very well. But, but simply here, this patient has had failure of the mucociliary function to return. And we see this elsewhere. I think you see it commonly in, in smokers and people who have bronchiectasis. So here's someone who's had surgery. And when you look with an angled camera, you can see this pooling of secretions. Now, when you see this pooling of secretions, what this is a flag for in my mind is that this person hasn't had mucociliary recovery occur. It's so not because the sinus surgeon opened the ostium uh, nine millimeters and it shouldn't have been seven or 11 and it should have been eight. It's simply a sinus cavity in which the clearance and mucociliary function has just failed to return and they're getting something or pooling of mucus. And you can even see it here on the CT scan. 
What do we do there? This is where surgery has a role, modified middle maxillectomy and other procedures that recontour the sinus cavity help to overcome this when it becomes a permanent feature. So why do we operate in diffuse CRS? You know, to me, ventilation is a false concept. Um, uh, many years ago, when I was with Rod Schlosser, we, we tried to sort of describe the sort of the situation that patients get caught in with sinus disease. And we developed this triangle, which just talks about mucosal inflammation, the, the, the mucociliary dysfunction, and then, then the infection or the microbial community that occurs. Now, it really is just a case of inflammation, mucostasis, and then some sort of infection or dysbiosis. And they all sort of play off each other. You know, you can imagine once you get mucostasis from inflammation that causes impaired cilia, then you get secondary infection that makes inflammation worse, that then begets further mucostasis and further inflammation. So you, you do see patients trapped in this situation. But, but ventilation and blockage is not important. And look, it's very, I think, a very unfortunate for our profession that we didn't acknowledge this early enough. And, you know, it's amazing that Larry Borish was, I think, the first person to really call it out where he came out and just said outright, sinus osteoclusion is no longer considered an important concept in especially eosinophilic CRS. And I think that's very, very true. And, and even if you look back in David Kennedy, I love to show David Kennedy old slides. And, and you know, I know he was a huge proponent for osteal disease. And, and certainly when we all see these old figures, you know, we all focus on this concept. But David was a smart man. He understood that actually all the other components are here in that, in, in this figure. You know, there's tissue inflammation, cilial damage, secretion stagnation, and then secondary bacterial infection. And I think this a little bit, we need to focus on these other components of the cycle, you know, very much in getting patients right. And this is why surgery will never be the answer for patients with diffuse disease, but it's also the reason why biologics are not going to be the answer alone for patients with diffuse disease. So surgery for me for someone with diffuse CRS is all about allowing topical therapy, overcoming mucostasis or plugging, overcoming secondary obstruction phenomenon, and it does reduce or reverse the tissue remodeling that's occurred over time. Now, if we look at why biologics are not the answer as well, if you look at the SNOT22 data from the biologics trial, and this is that same meta-analysis that was I showed you before for polyp score, but for SNOT22, there's no doubt polyps are a fantastic adjunct in helping us control the underlying inflammatory process. But some of the SNOT22 results are relatively modest. Now, you can say that they're used in a more select group, and that makes it even more important. But if you look at the effect on SNOT22 of something we're doing now, so this is from our RCT. We currently have a paradigm where we apply surgery and some sort of topical therapy. Now, now this is all patients. Although this RCT was to show that ir irrigation was superior to nasal spray, all patients here did very, very well with surgery and some sort of topical therapy. So there was a, a very strong effect on SNOT22 just through surgery and, and topical therapy you know, much greater than what we saw in the biologic trials. And so we mustn't abandon the idea of what we're achieving in surgery. Now, I think just to wrap up here, I want to talk about the at-risk patient. These are patients who need aggressive therapy early on. The at-risk or type 2 patient who we need to consider for some sort of early or aggressive anti-inflammatory therapy are those who need large doses of corticosteroids pre-surgery to get symptom relief people who have lower airways that aren't well controlled on maximal inhaled therapies. I don't think their upper airway is gonna be better controlled on just a local treatment either. Patients who don't normalize their sinus cavity at some point in time in the post-operative period, I can see that's been a theme on panels this afternoon. And those patients have a high serum eosinophilia at surgery at baseline is also another flag. And I think these are the patients in which I consider biologic therapies upfront or early to get it started and then to do surgery along the way. I often do that when there are two or three cycles into their biologic that we see an early response, then we go in and, and then reshape the sinus cavity. So in conclusion here, I think it's really time we acknowledge that the pathoetiology needs to be integrated into treatment strategies. It's not an infective disease, nor an obstructive one for people with diffuse CRS. 
Ventilation plays little role here for these patients with diffuse CRS. And we've got to manage it differently. We, uh, and I think Mickey Stewart touched on this, the idea that we, we can't really talk about single modality discussions. You can't say it's surgery or biologics or, or medical therapy or surgery. You know, this is false. It, it really is about an anti-inflammatory approach as a holistic approach. And you may utilize some or all of these ways of delivering anti-inflammatory medicine to our patients. And we've got to consider the concept of restoring or overcoming the mucociliary dysfunction that occurs in these patients. And, and surgery should be a tool that should be used to achieve a treatment goal in that holistic approach. And, and I think we've got to stop moving away from really reserving surgery somehow for patient, patients who have high symptom burden or simply just complain the most. And on that note, I, I'm going to wrap up and, and just say, if you have missed anything I've, I've spoken today, I'm sure it'll be on video, but I often do post my uh, lectures and things on our YouTube channel, and I'm always happy to direct you there. And I once again am very humbled to be asked to, to speak today, and I hope very much channeled the spirit of some of BJ Ferguson's uh, research in, in, the, in what we've discussed today. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you, Richard. You you have carried on that that spirit of uh, open inquiry that BJ had, and she was always willing to ask questions and think unconventionally. And uh, you demonstrate that uh, yourself. So that was wonderful. And in fact, a special treat for our attendees is that we can rewatch these presentations over the next month. They are going to be available for uh, registrants for our annual meeting and. I think I need to watch your talk two or three more times myself uh, to digest all that wonderful information. And really what you shared with us is a, a revolutionary change in how we conceptualize chronic rhinosinusitis, how we classify it, and then how we use that classification system to uh, precisely tailor our treatment to that individual patient. 